thanks everyone for coming out. Um, this is the final panel of Platypus, Platypus East Coast Conference. And uh, I'll just say a little bit about the Platypus Pavilion Society. Uh, the Platypus Pavilion Society organized reading groups, uh, public forum, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s and 30s, new 1960s and 70s, and post political 1980s and 1990s such to the possibilities of emancipatory policy today. So today's panel is entitled, What is the Critique of Capitalism? Marx critiqued capitalism in the 19th century, taking for his object the historical moment as expressed by the Industrial Revolution, the unsuccessful revolutions of 1848 and 1871, a weak liberalism, the centralization of state power, the rise of the workers' movement, and the promise of socialism. Since then, Marx's critique has been used in manifold ways and to many different ends. What does it mean that Marx's critique of capitalism still appeals a century and a half later? What is the relevance of Marx's critique to the critique of the status quo? As a set of historically specific insights that fail to grasp the nature of capitalism today in the neoliberal era, or as still expressive of the central task of emancipatory politics? Our panelists here, from uh, right to left, are Daniel Lazar, or Lazare. Daniel Lazare is a journalist. Lazar, Lazar. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Daniel Lazar. Uh, Daniel Lazar is a journalist who writes regularly for the Weekly Worker in London, published by the Communist Party of Great Britain. He's also the author of The Frozen Republic, How the Constitution is Paralyzing Democracy, and two other books about the Constitution as well. Uh, to his left, we have Tom Pinnell. Tom Pinnell is a trade unionist and a socialist. Uh, and next to him, we have Danny. Danny Jacobs is a member of the Black Lives Affiliated Society. And we have Jochen Schmoen. Uh, Jochen Schmoen is a PhD student in the Department of Politics at NSSR. His dissertation interrogates the ways in which the slave rebellions, the slave rebellions of the 18th century, as well as the abolition of chattel slavery, inscribe themselves in the political imaginaries of liberation mobilized by the left tradition of modern politics how the concept of slavery and the demand for its abolition have been used and abused in modern republicanism, feminism, socialism, and anarchism. Alongside his academic work, he's a seminar curator for the Literature Forum at Berlin's Bertolt Brecht House. He has been a permanent member of the German theater activist group, Center for Political Beauty, stealing state memorials for the dead of the German theater activist group, uh, uh, forgive me. Stealing state memorials for the dead of the Berlin Wall and naming them onto the border fences of the European, Uni European Union. Organizing state funerals of drowned refugees in the name of Chancellor Angela Merkel or rebuilding Berlin's Holocaust Memorial in the neighbor's, neighbor's garden of the most prominent far, -ring, far right politician in Germany. And then we have Cyril Rafi, a PhD candidate in political theory at the Graduate Center of Uni. She has translated Freud's group psychology and the analysis of the ego at Adorno's introduction to sociology into Farsi. She focuses on the works of the first generation of the Frankfurt School on social psychology of fascism. She is currently working on her PhD dissertation entitled On the Irrational of American Politics. Now each of the panelists will give their initial remarks. led to the discovery of the law of accumulation. Capital tends to centralize and concentrate in fewer and fewer hands. Structural implications of a system at the service of valorization of capital, such as ever increasing unemployment due to technological developments that would lower the cost of labor, globalization of capital in search of surplus value, along with dispositions that are required for the establishment of capitalist relations of production, would lead to mass pauperization. Pauperized masses would have nothing to lose but their chains. They would start a revolution and overthrow capitalism. The welfare era seemed to have brought this process to a halt. The improvement of the living standards of workers and a broad social safety net contradicted the prognosis of mass pauperization. As Piketty has substantiated though, the conditions in which the state managed to actively intervene in economics were unique. 
certain socioeconomic and political crises such as the Great Depression and the two world wars enabled the state to impose high taxes on capital and provide social services to the population. The process of monopolization of capital was nevertheless ongoing. After that short detour, the world quickly returned to its shape before the start of the First World War. We are allegedly living in another gilded age. There are, of course, major differences. Now capital is globalized. The process of monopolization and separation of forces of production and means of production have become almost absolute. And we are living once again an immense and intensifying financial crisis. Mass popularization is now a reality that has found expression through the idea of the 99%. As the world has probably never resembled Marx's prognosis more than today, currently any talk of a socialist revolution in the face of current crisis would sound lunatic. Overthrow of capitalism requires theory. In the absence of a revolutionary outlook based on theory, transition to a post-capitalist society would be just a hallucination. Without a plan for or imagination of a different future, the potentials for which already exist, of a radical shift mediated through the present moment, the very same crisis that could be seized for revolution could lead to catastrophe. The rise of Nazism to power in the 1930s was one such catastrophe. At the time of crisis, socialism would just be one of the options. Barbarity would be the other. The potential for barbarity is interwoven with structural tendencies of capitalism. The monopolization process entails the gradual elimination of the petty bourgeoisie. The average life of small businesses in the US is eight and a half years. The middle position of the petty bourgeoisie from small business owners to professionals makes them particularly susceptible to authoritarianism of fascist propaganda. Constant fear of loss of status turns into existential anxiety for this class. Capitalism reinforces some of the character traits that are rooted in parenting patterns and family dynamics. Its demands from the individual, such as adaptability and discipline, have given rise to a new anthropological type, the potentially fascist character, the authoritarian personality. Neoliberal subjectivity is partly the outcome of the intensification of some of those demands. The susceptibility of authoritarian personality to fascist propaganda would not be enough for the victory of fascism. As Adorno pointed out in 1968, without the support of capital, fascism would not be able to get into power. And considering the adventurism and unexpectable nature of fascist movements, supporting them would always be the capital's last resort. Given the susceptibility of potentially fascist character, the conditions would be ripe for the moment that the bourgeoisie would recognize that for overcoming the existing crises, it has no option but to back the fascist leader who happens to have gained a considerable audience. By putting blame on illegal immigrants, blacks, Jews, or Muslims for crisis and misery, fascist propaganda turns them into at hand targets for projection of frustration, resentment, and anxiety, and prevents consciousness about their real social and class interests. It is through cathartic, and cathartic performance of the audience's wishes for being rich and powerful, and as a protagonist of a crucible against cultural degeneracy with whom they can identify, that Trump manages to convince the audience to back policies that are at odds with their interests and at the service of the 1%. In the performance of the leader, the audience sees the realization of a verbal show of power, of how it would put those who have created this mess in their place. Within this framework, fantasy of the past, when things were supposedly perfect and the in-group was very prosperous, respected, and in control, replaces the imagination of a better future. Reviving that past as against all the efforts of internal and external enemies becomes the sole aspiration of the movement. Imagination is blocked. Fascism responds to crisis through psychological manipulation of the audience to support against their own interests policies that allow the bourgeoisie to benefit from political intervention it requires for overcoming the crisis. Critique of capitalism offers rational analysis that would make the imagination of an alternative order possible. We are living the age of immense crises. Climate crisis has endangered the survival of human species. The immediate need for a stopping the use of fossil fuel and for radical transformation of patterns of production, distribution, and consumption 
is entangled with ownership of means of production. Capitalist relations of production are the most important barrier against transformation of consumption and production patterns for accommodating nature. With the continuation of capitalist system, self-preservation of human species will be at stake. Critique of capitalism is necessary because transition to post-capitalist society would only be possible through determinate negation of what makes capitalism capitalism. Rational analysis of the mechanisms that constitute capitalism explains the socio-economic and political conditions that have given rise to the current crisis and as such makes the contemplation of an alternative order possible. The idea of socialization of means of production as a possible solution to the crisis no matter how improbable given the existing conditions, relies on analysis and critique of capitalism. The perpetuation and hypostatization of capitalist relations of production through culture, industry, and positive, positive science has deprived us from the capacity to imagine an alternative world. Critique of capitalism is necessary for such an imagination, for a rational solution to the current crises. It is a condition of possibility of a rational way out of the current and ever-growing barbarity. Thank you. So, can you hear me like that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Marx famously proclaimed in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right the task of philosophy can, not, can be nothing else but criticism, which can and must be used as a weapon in the struggle for universal human emancipation. Not as Hegel praised the old of Minerva as philosophy's coat of arms, as a passive theoretical reconstruction of what already is. Philosophy only becomes such an emancipatory weapon by the denunciation, to quote Marx, of all forms of consciousness that force us to recognize and acknowledge this fact of being dominated, governed, and possessed. In short, critique must be oriented towards praxis. Criticism must be effective in a political struggle for universal human liberation. And even the political principle of, of universal human emancipation that leads Marx's critical project is not just an arbitrarily set normative ideal, but a politically necessary demand and objective because, as Marx says, no type of enslavement can be abolished until all enslavement is destroyed. However, critique can only be, become such a weapon for a politics of universal human liberation when, I quote Marx, it has seized the masses. And those masses, the populace, the many, the multitude, the proletariat, can only be seized by a genuine anthropological radicalism. And I quote Marx, to be radical is to grab, grab things by the root. And for human beings, the root is to be a human being. That is, a species being that ontologically depends on the material conditions in and for which it can, can or cannot satisfy its needs. Radical politics must be centered on the interrogation, institutionalization, and preservation of the conditions that allow human beings to satisfy their material needs as species beings. And as Marx conceptualized it in his Paris Manuscripts of 1844, I quote, the life of the species, both in human beings and in animals, consists physically in the fact that human beings, like animals, live in inorganic nature. Um, I quote Marx in a longer um, paragraph, physically human beings live only on these products of nature, whether they appear in the form of food, heating, clothes, dwelling, or whatever it may be. The universality of human beings is in practice manifested precisely in the universality which makes all nature their inorganic body, both inasmuch as nature is first the direct means of life and second the material, the object, and the instrument of their life activity. However, what Marx calls nature, from which human beings as species beings most fundamentally depend, becomes hostile and alien under capitalism which describes a strictly political organization of the natural world, of which human beings are an irreducible part of, that divides human beings into two antagonistic classes, the property owners and the property-less workers, as Marx concludes. The worker sinks to the level of a com of commodity, and that wretchedness of the worker, as Marx goes on, is in inverse proportion to the power and magnitude of his production. That the necessary result of competition is the accumulation of capital in a few hands, and thus the restoration of monopoly in a more terrible form. <coughs> the logic is, the logic of capitalism is, 
that the more workers work on the capitalist modes of production, the more workers continue to contribute to the making of a world that is hostile to themselves, that creates the conditions of their own premature death, as Ruth Wilson Gilmer would say. Capitalist labor transforms the natural conditions of their life into conditions of death. And if Marx's humanist universalism holds true, it is not only the death of the working class that the working class itself produces under capitalism, but it is the death of the species itself. Facing global warming, as well as the immense ecological disruptions and systemic destruction of the habitability of vast parts of the world that follow from it, this decidedly Marxist humanism seems to have become even truer than it has been in Marx's own historical time. Capitalism is a political economic mode of universal natural self-destruction of planetary suicide. In what follows, I want to point to recently to the recently most important contributions in political philosophy that pursue such a strategy of critiquing capitalism outlined by what some have called the young Marx. I don't really like want to discuss like the yeah, I'll just fame of an epistemological break that happened some somewhere before Das Kapital. Um, but I'm definitely um, interested um, yeah, in recent resurrection of a decidedly Marxist form of humanism. Um, the philosophical anthropology, the question of what makes for the human condition in a Marxist analytic. And this anthropological question must be posed as central for the critical analysis of contemporary forms of capitalist domination, which always comes with Marx's categorical imperative of critically inscribing that very analysis into ongoing struggles against capital and for human universal liberation. In the spirit of, of this Marxist humanism, and also like with the help of Bruno Latour's Gaia theory, Deepesh Chakrabarty calls for the planetary as a new universal nodal point towards which all our intellectual and political energies must be directed. Who is the we that is interpolated by this very demand? All of us. Humanity, as he says, as a species. It is, as Chakrabarty is well aware of, <coughs> humanity was to claim, risking to erase the fundamental differentiatedness of so-called humanity, along deep lines of racialized, gendered, and economic classifications. It risks erasing the history and presence of empire, capitalism, and patriarchy, as well as the epistemic achievements of the critical faculties of scholarship from political economy to post-colonial and gender studies. We, which is never pre-existing or emerging outside discursive and imaginary articulations, is simply our life as a species called human beings that inhabit geobiological spheres in common with non-human beings. And from the well-being of all these spheres and all non-human species, the well-being of the human species is fundamentally depending on. But we human beings, as Chakrabarty would conclude, have radically disavowed and neglected this fundamental geobiospherical and interspecies dependency by the very forms of life that we have historically established to inhabit the planet. Instituted in capitalism, industrial technology and political systems that have no capacity to cope with the very systemic destruction which they have brought upon themselves and every other species on the planet. The planetary is conceptualized by Chakrabarty in a twofold scale. It is the emergence of a new universal world historical consciousness for what he calls the planet and of its geobiological history. This planetary consciousness relates itself to the world in the form of a species being called Anthropos that is constitutively depending on and shapes the ecological and geological well-being of the planet. This emphasis does neither allow to simply blame capitalism nor technology, as um, Chakrabarty concludes, because socialist re regimes have also systematically contributed to the geobiospherical destruction. But the question of how to cope with global warming must necessarily engage with both capitalism and technology. This is why the extremely differentiated impacts to and to different people on the planet, both historically and presently, regarding the making of and suffering from the Anthropocene, remains an imperative. As Chakrabarty is very clear, differentiations of capital and labor, empire and colony, gendered and racialized divisions have radically and evenly contributed to and profited from the making of an anthropocentric world. Yes. Chakrabarty is calling for nothing less than a planetary concept of the political. Political action in the sense is that which helps humans to be at home on Earth beyond the term, the time of their living. But in, like, 
beside of like his, his definitely uh, yeah, critical or like radical analysis that um, the existing modes of production and the existing political systems are incapable of actually solving the crisis, he completely, um, he completely um, steps back from the challenge of inscribing his own analysis into ongoing political struggle. And instead, in the spirit of better to use an Adornian notion, in the unspirit of current academic jargon, he calls for imagining other forms of planetary politics. Nowhere in his political, political or ecological writings are movements mentioned that attempt to destroy technologies of planetary destruction. This is what Andreas Malm, here in his work on fossil fascism, has most convincingly demonstrated. The most dominant analysis of cl climate change and anthropocentric politics from Latour to Chakrabarty or Anand Singh, have continuously failed to, to stress that each movement, moment of sustained business as usual is the outcome of struggle. We do not simply have to acknowledge the political economic sources of climate change and have to imagine new forms of sustainable life. We need to struggle for the abolition of the existing means of planetary destruction. It is a very simple political principle, and even if she can be criticized on so many other political questions, that Greta Thunberg pronounced. If the emissions have to stop, then we must stop the, the emissions. And Andreas Mayer is a member of German anarchist movement Endegelände that squats coal mining factories, gas pipelines, and forests, um, forests open for fossil fuel production, um, is rather explicit in his manifesto how to blow up a pipeline. When do we start physically attacking the things that consume our um, land? Uh, I'd like you to please uh, round up your remarks. Yeah, one minute. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, when do we start physically attacking the things that consume our planet and destroy them with our own, own hands? The forms of dissidence that characterize the mass mobilizations around climate change must be escalated. The dominantly nonviolent strategy of the radical ecological left must not be replaced, but extended by a militant wing that attacks fossil capitalist technologies directly with physical violence. To absolutize nonviolent forms of protest, unwillingly rest, as Mom argues, on the presumption that the available ruling classes will either be forced to planetarily rational decisions by forms of fossil fuel civil disobedience, or that the existing oppositional parties will come to power and then act rationally. Yeah, I think I will leave it. First, the word capitalism. We know it is not capitalistism, a rule by the capitalists, but rather capitalism. I imagine a good student would raise their hand and tell us that capital is not a thing, but a social relation. Okay, cool. But what does that mean? The German distinction between Gemeinschaft, community versus Gesellschaft, society is helpful here. Social relations are not personal relations or group mores and customs or laws or technical relations. They refer to something new in humanity, to society. Diderot and Glambert's 18th century encyclopedia reminds us that the word social, which designates, quote, those qualities that make a man a useful member of society who is suited for living with other men, unquote, was at the time a relatively new word. Humans have always been concerned with utility, but to be part of the same human organization, because all involved are useful to each other, gives an open-ended character to this form of human organization. Consequently, social relations were formed despite potentially antagonistic purposes. There was a general will or something that was greater than some of its parts. That interest was society. If we trace this back, it appears that society originates between communities in what is narrowly referred to as exchange. Indeed, that word means the transformation, change, through something coming from without, X. Society then was founded upon the identity across difference. Rousseau and Adam Smith read this into the very nature of the species in what they called pity or sympathy. Social relations then were the actualization of the potential for change. Importantly, they had an intentionality. There was a reason they emerged when they did. Thus, Marx writes that while prices in exchange are older than the biblical flood, only in modern or bourgeois society do they come to be increasingly determined by the modern or bourgeois social relation of labor. That is, their intention is to facilitate the modern bourgeois notion of freedom, of freedom to become. The serfs and slaves who ran away to the barren cities of the former Holy Roman Empire already had nothing but the labor on their backs. 
They didn't have any real tangible property of any significant sort, but they did have the skills brought from their home economy. They could relate through work, through time. The newly bourgeoisie were relatively uniform in skills and could trade based on specialization in different laboring functions. They related based on labor. It is not hard to imagine. If you've ever had a sibling, you've probably traded chores. But what kind of social relation is capital? Political economy, which in one sense had ended by Marx's time, had already characterized capital as accumulated labor which employed other labor. Indeed, as put in the Communist Manifesto, in bourgeois society, the past dominates the present. In communist society, the present dominates the past. Being past labor, it's property. Locke had said, after all, that the first property was when we mix our labor with that of the land. It can't act on its own. Capital must have recourse to its guardians. There is a reason for property. It facilitates social powers that have developed and legitimize their right. But property requires many successive ideas before its form, such or so. Or to put it in another way, humanity must have already been changed out of its natural state for property to have become. Thus it requires somebody to act in a way to make it useful such that it continues to be part of the society. The realization of the relation is what preserves the end. But domination is very different than use. How is it that the product comes to be the master over the producer? The producer is a human. They act with a purpose and therefore can only be dominated by the product if the latter ropes it into its own end. Adam Smith had articulated the division of labor as allowing all and everyone to find their value in society. This was the adequate consciousness for the time. The philosophes of the Enlightenment made an object of society and in doing so allowed her to be extended through critique. The formerly marginalized groups could extend the division of labor through the critique of the existing forms of cooperation. For Smith, the powers of social cooperation were truly the property of the workers. The employers, in a sense, could only help to set the cooperation in motion, but they could not remove it from the workers, and this remained the workers' claim against their bosses. The wage relation was antagonistic, but not self-contradictory at Smith's time. Thus, the inclusion of more and more people into the cooperation was in the interest of the workers. The exploitation of the workers could be justified in a free society. After all, it built the edifice of human civilization for the next generation of workers that they would inhabit. The ideal of bourgeois society is a worker society. The workers' strength was their interdependence, but the interdependence grew so great so as to hold every worker against their own social powers. The extension of the division of labor also made it an object, one that could be studied and objectified. The workers had socialized production implicitly, and in their struggle with their employers, they politicized what they had detached from themselves. Their employers simply made good on the potential, and soon the workers faced their own powers, capitalized, and throwing them out of society. Thus, after the Industrial Revolution, writes Max Horkheimer, not work but workers are made superfluous. The workers had pressed their bourgeois rights, and in and through such, made themselves redundant. The result was not juridical, but political economic. This ought to have led straight into socialism. Indeed, the very modern concept reflects the fact that capitalist production already expropriates the expropriators, already socializes production. But this process happened unconsciously. The workers had estranged their right to work, but they could still fight for and claim their political rights. The extension of democracy, then, was a symptom of the Industrial Revolution. This is why class struggle is political struggle. This gets to then the word proletariat. Proletarian is given every definition in the world, working class, worker, poor, pauper, industrial worker, wage laborer. But Marx was fond of quoting Sismondi, who said that while the ancient proletariat lived at the expense of society, modern society lives at the expense of the proletariat. That means the proletariat exploits themselves, but it has the same force that holds society together and tears it apart. Because it ends with an ism, we are primed to think of capitalism like it is a system, a system of exploitation or a system of oppression, imperialism, colonialism, etc. But Rosa Luxemburg was not so naive. Quote, no general institution exists in society that would consciously construct and operate these laws which make up what is referred to as capitalism. Capitalism is a crisis. There are not crises of capitalism, and its systematic appearance is a necessary form by which the crisis misleads us by the nose but also compels us to try to put it back together. The systematic character is the fixation on bourgeois social relations. It is ideological. 
The relations from the 16th century had facilitated forces from the 19th century, bursting the integument of the former and leading people to try to put these things back together. Thus, the 19th century repeats the 16th century. Marx's famous phrase that social being determines consciousness needs to be elaborated as an abuse. It is industrial social being that determines bourgeois social consciousness, but it determines it in its irrationality, in what Marx called the anarchy of production. Bourgeois society had become self-contradictory, and this was expressed in the phrase, the capitalist mode of production. That is, bourgeois society, a society of commodity production, had become modified mode in capitalist character. The end of commodity production became the production of capital. In other words, our sense of injustice, of a wronged life, is bourgeois. For that is the only rational standard we have, and we react to it by trying to perfect society. From very early on, Marx recognized socialism as, quote, not beginning a new work for humanity, but consciously carrying into effect its old work. It was the task of the bourgeois revolution after the industrial revolution. This gets to the word critique. Critique did not mean one's moral or sensible repulsion, but rather accounting for the conditions of possibility. So the ancient view of the dialectic was one of self-correction of the thinker. But in modern society, dialectic took on a different purpose. The standard move from Rousseau to Kant to Hegel was to ask what was the presupposed in the given world. These revolutionaries appropriated that given world with an emancipatory use of cunning. Hegel, as a high consciousness of the third estate, based the entire self-movement of history upon freedom self-critique. So one more minute. Uh, the workers were most painfully aware of the difference between thinking, being and thinking between consciousness of life, and they were driven forward through the forms of capitalist society, from the machines to the capitalists to the bankers to the state, and onwards in the final analysis, hopefully to themselves. This last step, by the way, is called socialism. The proletariat was a hair of German idealism for Frederick Engels, not because they had a mere theoretical interest in the dialectical method, but because they are responsible for the dialectic of capitalism, a negative dialectic. If the proletariat is part and principle of the crisis and is the leading critic of such, then it follows that the critique of capitalism itself is really a part of capitalism. In other words, capitalism is its own self-critique. After all, it was only with Proudhon's critique of political economy that Marx believed an actual critique of political economy had become possible for Proudhon to represent the proletarian spirit. And I've run out of time, but we'll talk about critique and criticism. People might find it obnoxious for a non-Marxist to mansplain, as it were, what Marxists should think. But you have to understand how much fun it is. It's like a drug. I'm going to begin by citing a more or less sacred text that derives the citations of sacred texts. And this is going to be a little bit extended citation. Um, in What is Orthodox Marxism, Lukács writes, quote, let us assume for the sake of argument that recent research had disproved once and for all, sorry, sorry, disproved once and for all, um, every, uh, 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 lost now. Uh, yeah. Let us assume for the sake of argument that recent research had disproved, had disproved once and for all every one of Marx's individual theses. Even if this were to be proved, every serious orthodox Marxist would still be able to accept all such modern findings without reservation and hence dismiss all of Marx's theses in toto without having to renounce orthodoxy for a single moment. Orthodox Marxism therefore does not imply the uncritical acceptance of the results of Marx's investigation. It is not the belief in this or that thesis, nor the exegesis of a sacred book. On the contrary, orthodoxy refers exclusively to method is the scientific conviction that dialectical materialism is the road to truth and that its methods can be developed, expanded, and deepened only along the line laid down by its founders. It is the conviction, moreover, that all attempts to surpass or improve it have led and must lead to oversimplification, triviality, and eclecticism." Unquote. By the way, while I deny the charges of oversimplification and triviality, I fully cop to the eclecticism thing, and you'll shortly see why. Um, I think in these lines, 
Lukács has encapsulated what the Marxist response to the questions facing this panel would be. Uh, by the way, it's really interesting, I think, that Lukács does not say that orthodox Marxism will always exist so long as there is a proletariat whose class consciousness it represents. If we were to rely on just these lines quoted, you could still have orthodox Marxism even if there was no revolutionary proletariat. I'm not saying that Lukács believed that, but I'm just, you know, saying. It would be a gross exaggeration to say that all of Marx's individual theses have been disproven. Theses regarding the globalization and concentration of capital, for example, have been historically vindicated, I think. But it would be fair to say that unpredictable mutations in capitalism require a radical, I choose my next word deliberately, revision of a large proportion of Marx's individual theses. I don't think this should be surprising. St. Thomas Aquinas, I have heard, respond to the question how, if Christianity was eternal truths, there could ever be innovations in Christian theology. Aquinas' answer, because heresy always takes new forms. <laughs> His, history has thrown out unpredicted, and I think unpredictable mutations in the structure of capitalism. Marxism, through applying dialectical materialism, should address those mutations theoretically and draw appropriate political conclusions. The classic Marxist critique of Marx capitalism, it seems to me, focuses on the, on the hand, one hand, on the alienation of labor, how workers are forced to confront their own product, capital, as an alien force, and how the, the distinction in bourgeois society between the exchange value of labor power and the use value of labor, labor is used to create value, conceals and naturalizes the reality of capitalist exploitation. The worker is paid the full exchange value for the labor power they expend, which happens to be less than the value their labor has actually created. Both the understanding of capitalist alienated labor and the understanding of exploitation under capitalism rely on some forms of labor theory of value. However, robotics, automation, and a, dig a digital technology have made the labor theory of value obsolete, not just as a theory of price, which it, of course, never was, but as a key to understanding the accumulation of capital and therefore capitalism. Value derives as much or more these days from the quality and quantity of information monopolized than abstract homogenous labor put into production. Marx, in his discussion of the general intellect of capital society, presaged this development to a large extent, but did not realize how this development would transform the nature of capitalism itself. Historical reality poses contemporary Marxists with the task of understanding the new economic reality in dialectical materialist terms. Now, there are attempts to understand this new re reality in at least semi-Marxist terms. On the one hand, you have a debate in the New Left Review and elsewhere concerning techno-feudalism. On the other, we have the arguments of Roberto Unger, the emergence of a new knowledge economy. How much is hope is exhibited concerning the emancipatory potential of this economic transformation is vastly different according to the two perspectives. While Unger sees the integration of imagination into the labor process as potentially emancipatory, enabling the production process to be based on trust, non-hierarchical cooperation, um, I remember that um, part of the syllabus teaching me that capitalism is the negation of bourgeois freedom, freedom emanating from the crisis of bourgeois society. Um, I am tempted to impute to Unger the hope that knowledge economy generated freedom will negate capitalist unfreedom, reintroducing a new form of bourgeois freedom, the negation based on the crisis of industrial capitalism. The discerners of techno-feudalism, on the other hand, see a coming pervasive, sinisterly total domination through a monopoly on information that enables the extraction of wealth through rents rather than surplus unpaid labor. The owl of Minerva, we are told by Hegel, only takes flight at dusk. Perhaps we will only know how the digital economy will turn out once it has come to full fruition. Under is clear, I think, that the emancipatory outcome is not inevitable. 
only bringing the knowledge economy into the core of our economies and productive activities, and radically democratizing and equalizing the holding of knowledge will enable a positive outcome. He would acknowledge, I think, that techno-feudal techno dystopia um, is a possible outcome of the failure to do that, perhaps even a necessary outcome of the failure to do that. If the avoidance of dystopia is dependent upon a radical democratic response to the knowledge economy, then that might define the fundamental political task which history is presenting us. It would behoove Marxists, I believe, to apply dialectical materialist um, methodology to this question to see if they agree. Do I have a moment still to go? Yeah, two minutes. Two minutes, great. Um, Platypus pedagogy, if I understand it correctly, suggests that the only way to defend bourgeois freedom under capitalism is to actually go beyond capitalism, uh, where capitalism is understood as uh, bourgeois society in crisis. Unger's analysis suggests that a democrat democratized uh, knowledge economy might be sufficient to restore bourgeois freedom. But he doesn't, as far as I know, and people who, who read more of his stuff may be able to correct me on this, he doesn't explicitly say whether you need to overthrow capitalism in order to have a democratized knowledge economy. Um, and, um, and I think that is a key question that socialists and Marxists should consider. Thanks a lot. Exactly 50 years ago, I was uh, I got off a boat uh, in Genoa, Italy, and wandered into the center of the town. Um, and every square inch of wall space, as far as as I recall, was covered with a radical poster. Most of the Trotskyists, some now was three four Trotskyists. I was like every square inch, and seemingly on every corner there were young people passing out leaflets of some revolutionary sort. Um, and I uh, returned to Genoa uh, uh, this summer, um, almost exactly 50 years later, uh, and there was nothing. Um, and this is a puzzle, because 1972 was the towards the end of the post-war world. Um, and uh, I mean, capitalism, had, had, was had going through a period of efflorescence that was all transformative. Uh, life for the working class uh, was just made over countless times. Uh, uh, workers had vacations, they had cars, they had uh, access to, to, to creature comforts, even you know, luxury goods, um, none of which had none of which was even imaginable, imaginable in the 1930s and 20s. Um, uh, yet, during this period of capitalist efflorescence, there was, it coincided with a period of radical ebullience, where seemingly everybody was a Marxist, seemingly every square inch of wall space was covered with you know, a, a, a hammer and sickle and a four, you know, a four imposed on top of it. Um, and then now, 50 years later, there's, there's nothing. And yet we know that capitalism, that the memories of the of the, the, the golden age are long past, and capitalism is now in a period of, of, of rapid decline, where workers are are facing immiseration that you know that a, that a, a generation of bourgeois economists, you know, previously had said it was impossible, um, where we're now facing uh, uh, not only growing you know, tendency towards war, but even the threat of nuclear war, in some ways even more, more of a real threat than it was even, you know, in, in the 1960s during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, and, uh, and we're also facing a huge assault on democracy, political democracy. Um, uh, so none of these things were present to anywhere near the same extent in 1972 during a period of radical ebullience, and now that they are present, um, the left has seemingly vanished. Uh, it's a, it seems to be like a fad that went out with the Beatles. 
Um, so how do we explain this? And, um, and essentially, what does that indicate for the trajectory that the working class is on? Um, does it mean that 60s radicalism was nothing more than a, a product of capitalist ebullience? That it was kind of a, a youthful you know, explosion, uh, a fad, as I said before, um, not to be taken seriously? Um, and, uh, and is the current condition where the left has melted away, is that the real condition? I mean, is there no hope, no prospect at all for any kind of concerted working class um, response to, uh, to, to deepening capitalist uh, breakdown? Um, uh, the title of this talk is a critique of, uh, of, of capitalism. Um, and the question is, can we critique capitalism uh, if we have no prospect of overcoming capitalism? In other words, if there's no, if there's no program, no, no true anti-capitalist program which leads us to beyond capitalism to a new form of civilization. Um, and and the, 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 the political vacuum that we see on the left um, would suggest that, that we have a, arrived at an impasse and that therefore no critique of capitalism is possible because we can only criticize it at the margins, we can only criticize aspects of it, we can criticize its environmental you know, policies, its, its military policies, et cetera, but there can be no critique, fundamental critique of capitalism today. Um, needless to say, I don't agree with that. I mean, needless to say, I think that the period we are in now, the, the, the great trajectory, the great post-war wave, which saw 30 years of, of capitalist uh, efflorescence has given way to 50 years of, of accelerating capitalist decline. Um, and that decline is now reaching a, a, a precipitous point. Um, I think that essentially the working class will have to respond. Um, I think that historically it's quite clear there is no alternative to the working class responding. And that therefore, given no alternative, the working class will respond. And the, the sense that we all have in this room of, of treading water, of lack of traction, of a, a sort of like, you know, sort of descending into, you know, to, to ever more airless critiques of capitalism, uh, and critiques that are divorced from any kind of practical struggle against cap capitalism, I think that we are reaching the end of that epic. Um, and I think that we are about to be entering a new age where a a political critique of capital becomes possible because the political overthrow of capitalism will be posed. Um, and to put this in, in, in more concrete terms, I mean, we are, we are facing a, a perfect storm, uh, and especially here in the United States. Um, we are facing a profound uh, climate crisis, which is manifesting itself in ever more um, dramatic ways. Uh, um, we are facing a economic crisis uh, where I mean, clearly the, the, the Keynesian response to the, to the meltdown of 2008 is now running out of steam. Uh, capitalism has run through its bag of tricks to keep the, uh, the economic machinery uh, going. Uh, and now, now we're faced with the, the, the we're faced with the confrontation that, that, that capitalism was able to avoid 12 or 14 years ago. Now that confrontation is coming, and we're facing a, a, a wrenching uh, economic crisis. And we're also facing uh, an assault on democracy that is absolutely unprecedented. Uh, I mean, um, we're, we're facing midterm elections in four weeks. Uh, in which um, it seems likely that a Republican Party, which is which is moving in an ever more explicitly anti-democratic small-t 
direction will take a take power in both houses of Congress. Um, they will use okay, that to. Can I ask you? Like, like, like a, no, no. You have two minutes. Okay, okay two minutes. Right. right. So, so um, we'll um, we'll likely take out uh, take control of Congress of both houses of Congress. We'll uh, we'll move to um, to uh, to put uh, to impeach Joe Joe Biden on corruption charges. Not sure. Um, the Supreme Court is uh, is about to decide uh, to, to consider a case called uh, Henry v. Moore, I think it is, which. Um, uh, uh, it's, it poses the question of known as, uh, as ISL, independent, uh, uh, um, independent state legislature theory, which essentially will essentially sideline for good the popular vote in presidential elections, um, thereby rendering the U.S. you know ever more explicitly undemocratic, authoritarian, <laughs> oligarchical, etc. So these three forces are, are bearing down in a, in a, in a perfect storm. Um, and essentially, that is the prospect we are facing. And that is what convinces me, and this is kind of a, a, a backwards argument, that the era, era of, of tractionless, of being of the, of the, the, uh, the immobilized, uh, inert, working class uh, is coming to an end, and that what we are seeing is the, uh, we are on the verge of a great uh, proletarian explosion, which will essentially uh, make Marxism, the Marxist critique of capitalism, uh, socialist revolution, etc., will take these very abstract forms and give them life. Of capitalism as its object. So I just wanted to kind of raise that 
um, as a, a, a thought right there. Um,
And that it's more about like blockading, squatting specific technologies of ecological destruction, that it's about blockading police uh, in deportation work. Um, but what that would be is like lost, and maybe this is something also that like, yeah, this um, yeah, political society itself is interested in, is a party politics. Um, and uh, Andreas Mann, which I was like briefly um, talking about, uh, has a very interesting theory on hegemony because he thinks that there is like a there is like a necessity for like a, a radical militant flank. That historically you can see that the moments when like the left was very strong, you always had on each kind of like political battleground, like from party politics to kind of like civil disobedience and also like violent forms of destruction, which were all, like always called terrorism. Um, and all these like different modes of um, struggle and strategy, um, anti-capital strategy, were producing something like a hegemony um, that was actually helping in some countries to overcome capitalism or to like produce also a counter force that was forcing the established capitalist parties to, in some way or another, include uh, redistribution politics. Um, and so yeah, I kind of like agree with that there is like a problem on the left on like uh, strategy maybe, but like it's not like the death of, of the left itself and we kind of more have to think about how like we kind of like embed like a Marxist criticism into these struggles that maybe opens up again like the battleground of party politics. Uh, well, um, I think um, such strategy would be um, nonsensical unless we have some plan or idea of how to run the world and not just particular countries because that is not going to work. And I think at this point, and I'm just going to insist that this is the moment that unless the left comes up with some alternative idea for how to do things, fascism is just there and it's gaining uh, power and uh, the catastrophe that it will entail, uh, like um, added to uh, the climate crisis is just going to be, you know, like very detrimental to human species. So I think um, it's not just about the activities of this or that leftist group here or there. It's about a collective effort at uh, thinking about another world order uh, through, like, as you mentioned, planetary politics, internationalism, however you call it. But without such a plan, uh, fascism is going to be our fate. Right, sure. Uh, um, Sayure? Sayura? 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 Uh, I, I agree with you totally. Uh, I think that essentially, um, uh, oh, sorry, I, I agree with you totally. I think it's, uh, it's, it's not enough simply to attack capitalism, uh, but it's, um, it's just arid, uh, unless you have a program, uh, uh, a socialist program. Uh, and I, I think, by the way, um, in response to some of the uh, Things that uh, Jochen, I think it was, uh, said. Um, I, I think attacking pipelines is a very bad idea. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it will not be understood as the working class. It's a kind of substitutionalism in which uh, activists uh, uh, substitute themselves to the working class and will leave workers perplexed, confused, will deprive them of jobs, um, may even kill them, by the way. Um, uh, I think that the um, that it's not enough simply to stop capitalism. We have got to replace capitalism. Uh, I think the um, the task is the the great historical task of socialism uh, is how to um, accelerate industrial production while at the same time um, reducing carbon outputs. We have we are facing a, a 
a, a great industrial challenge where we'll, we will have to move, for the first time since the birth of the Industrial Revolution, move to non-carbon forms of, uh, of power. And that involves, um, uh, that involves you know, hydro, solar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Also involves radical conservation, reductions in, uh, in, in, uh, in energy consumption. But it cannot be done at the expense of the working class uh, because the working class is the only one that can make this leap and it's got to be done through the self-manifestation, self-expression uh, of the working class, where the working class itself transforms the economy um, and transforms itself, but doesn't, doesn't impoverish itself, quite the contrary, you know, it, it enriches itself shallow, silly, bourgeois way, but it does enrich itself in a socialist way. Um, uh, and I think a critique of capitalism is really impossible without a struggle against capitalism. And a struggle against capitalism is really impossible without, it, it's kind of a, a difficult under current historical circumstances, which is why the critique seems to be going nowhere. And it's only when the historical circumstances change and the working class begins to move that we can move. We can uh, begin to transition to an effective, dynamic, uh, uh, powerful critique of, uh, of capitalism. And um, uh, Tom said that dialectical method uh, is, is a really valuable uh, tool, but, but dialectical method is empty without a program. I mean, I mean, a dialectical method implies a critique of capitalism and implies a, a, a political critique of capitalism and therefore a leaping beyond, an overcome of capitalism into, into, into socialism. Uh, and so uh, this attempt to, to depoliticize Marx, to somehow divorce Marxism from political program, I think is, is a completely no anti-Marxist. Thank you all. Um, I think a lot was said in the panel about the need for an anti-capitalist struggle. And I guess I just wanted to ask all the panelists, um, what is capitalism? And what is an anti-capitalist struggle? Capitalism is a private ownership of the uh, of the means of production, I mean, I, and production and, and, and uh, industrial capitalism is a collective enterprise uh, by the proletariat, but one whose you know whose benefits are then monopolized and expropriated by the uh, by the uh, owners of the uh, means of production. Uh, and uh, I think someone here used the phrase uh, uh, "anarchy of production." Uh, uh, I think that's what, how Marx describes uh, capitalism. Uh, yes, it's an anarchy of production that is now leading to generalized. I'm a completely, you know, a, a complete anarchy of, of society, uh, and I think the working class has got to uh, has got to take control uh, of of those processes and begin uh, reconstructing society through radical democratic socialist means, and and, and that and that that attempt is what will lead to uh, a, a socialism, which is the essentially gaining control of the of this fantastic industrial system we have and making it work for the uh, not only the 99 percent of the population but in a global term the 99.99 percent uh, of population I mean we you know we have uh, we, capitalism that has, has has made miracles as, as Marx pointed out uh, but now it's uh, it's using those miraculous developments to destroy society and this is what socialism has, uh, has got to overcome. We've got to stop this process of self-destruction. And I think it's possible. I, th I think that's all right. Um, uh, what I would say is that capitalism is a society and economy rounded and driven um, in the need to, to accumulate ever more, ever more capital. Um, and that the, um, the what, what we want to replace um, capitalism with is 
into a society where production and, and, and social energy is directed towards the meeting of social and human needs. Um, and um, um, we also want it to be democratic and, and, and all that other things. Um, but I think it's a specifically anti-capitalist um, part of our, of our uh, program relates around that. One of the other question, but I'll just uh, have a stab at it, which is I would say, back to what um, Daniel was saying earlier, that we know of capitalism is in trouble with it, um, which is often used as a kind of uh, uh, is it, um, carte blanche for I don't know, some kind of activism or something like that. But what's really meant by that is that we know about capitalism through the self contradiction of how we try to struggle with it. And that's why I mentioned that we should have just kind of gone right into socialism. But the question was, how does that attempt to change the world uh, repeat itself? In other words, we know the contradiction through regression and through repetition. So when we say things like the private appropriation of the means of, you know, by the means, but private ownership of the means of production. The private ownership of the means of production is a category of contradiction. Right? I mean, the means of production is a very broad term. It's not like, do you own hammers, which the workers did in the manufacturing era, but all the conditions that go into that, and it's manifest in a kind of private appropriation. It's expressing the bourgeois social relations in industrial production. But we only know of industrial production refracted through bourgeois social relations. I mean, we actually have a kind of uh, you know, distorted view in that sense, and socialism kind of reflected that. I think you used it the line about uh, communism is the real movement of history. But the real movement is like also a self-contradiction. It's not just, you know, communism is straight up to space in that sense. But um, so everything, all of these phrases that have been kind of passed down for Marx, they meant something as a self-critique of the critique of capitalism. But they're kind of used as expressive and descriptive terms today. And I would say that their purchase continues to happen because they seem to still articulate something that's become very invisible to us, which is that of society. So I think I would also raise as well, on, in terms of the question of um, kind of the environment, I was, you know, I wrote to myself, society versus Gaia or society versus the earth, meaning there are ways in which I would say destruction of society manifests itself in environmental degradation. And perhaps some of the kind of manifestations of the limits of ecology or the limits of the environment really reflect kind of the problem of, as Dan quoted me saying, quoting Marx, the anarchy of production. I mean, it kind of is dragging us along without any kind of conscious thing. So that maybe didn't quite answer, but I would really put it at the level of a crisis of society. And then the things that come out of that, even the category of capitalism itself, is a product of that crisis. And so that's where, that's why you would need a means to even reflect on that Whereas today we kind of receive Marx as, I don't know, another Adam Smith or another Hegel. Um, I definitely think that the critique of capitalism and also like a political project that goes, that struggles against it has to change today. And I do not think that we can simply say that we have these great economies, we have these great industrial technologies because I mean, this is almost becoming like a platitude, but we know from so many studies that our modes of production, that the technologies that we are using to produce the things that we need or do not need, destroy the planet. Um, and so, of course, we have to ask ourselves, like, what technologies need to be replaced, need to be abolished, like, what kinds of commodities we want to produce or not. Um, and it cannot simply be about, like, the old, Marxist paradigm of unleashing the productive forces because there's something wrong with specific productive, productive forces. And we have like a whole industry that is not just like fuel, but is also exhausting like vast amounts of CO2 that kill the planet. And so the project cannot be about, okay, like let's create a great life for everyone on the planet for 99% and using the existing technology of production for that, because that is literally suicidal. But just ask the question quickly, which would be, like the unleashing of the forces of production wouldn't necessarily mean greater pollution, it could also mean greater efficiency. And so perhaps the unleashing of it would mean not like the image of, um, you know, smokestacks and everything and, and environmental degradation, but actually 
rolling back on that. I think I think that's what Daniel. Well, maybe Daniel, you might want to jump yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, unleashing productive forces. I mean, uh, I mean, unleashing productive productive forces means unleashing for the first time creative forces. And creative forces are, you know, in in the, in the technological sphere, uh, you know, uh, deal with the question of how to, you know, of, of what kind of fuels we use what kind of technologies we use and for what reason um, you know do we uh, do we uh, do we do we, uh, do, we <laughs> do we use technology for, for private profit or pro profit or to make the world a better place for the 99.99 percent .99 of its inhabitants um, and uh, and I mean I, as I said before you know we need to put in very concrete terms the you know global warming we cannot keep producing you know, Putting out CO2 in the, into the into the uh, atmosphere, as you as you uh, put out, uh, point out, um, but that doesn't mean that we that we that we regress industrially. It means we we develop new forms of uh, of, of uh, in, industry, um, which are capable of, of, of using new power sources, uh, new efficiencies, new forms of conservation, new arrangements of society in order to maximize you know to to to. To, to get the most out of every ounce of energy, if that's a, every watt of energy. Um, so, uh, so, and so when you, when you unleash productivity, you unleash creativity. And the idea is to, you know, is that, you know, that, you know, that is what the, the great transformative process that, 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 that socialism hopes to uh, create. One thing. Um Johan, uh, uh, some members of the audience have asked, um, could you answer the question more specifically? They feel as if you didn't ask exactly of what is capitalism. Oh, I don't think that I'm disagreeing with the panel on this question at all. I think it's more about like, what is an anti-capitalist strategy. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, could you give Sarah a chance to respond and I'll take more questions from the audience? I think uh, there's no disagreement over uh, the meaning of capitalism, and I agree with most of the things that were said right now, but um, thinking about capitalism in concrete terms and an alternative to capitalism, we can think about and reflect on the current situation, and um, other speakers have already done that. So if we want to think about environmental crisis and see how it is being intensified, you could very easily, and as, as a species, we know that that process should stop right now. It is not being stopped, and even the very watered down uh, plants to you know like preserve uh, environment is being blocked in the Senate by you know Democrats themselves. So thinking about a post-capitalist society, I think would be you know this collective effort of us as human species to think how we want to live and how uh, we want to run uh, society. To me, that would be what socialism would entail. Yeah. Um, just a simple question. I guess I feel like I'm very suspicious of the language of, of anti-capitalism and anti-fascism. It seems to me that these are taken up now as projects of the ruling class and deeply reactionary. That we see the language of hostility to fascism being taken up by the dominant political and military force in the world, the United States. Um, we have weaponized uh, the military against uh, Putin's fascism and authoritarianism and we weaponized the um, repressive apparatus against the population in the name of, of anti-white supremacy. And it seems like anti-capitalism particularly, um, <coughs> excuse me, ecological anti-capitalism is being weaponized against the poor around the world. Um, as a project of austerity, and you know, we, we see people celebrating you know rising fuel prices, uh, which translates directly into uh, 
price of food prices. You know, as I was talking about in the last session, um, you know, a imminent process, an imminent prospect of the actual return of rising poverty rates, right, in you know around the world, which we haven't seen for decades. Um, more importantly, it seems to me that the language of anti-capitalism is um, often a kind of, it, 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 what it really masks is hostility to bourgeois rights, right? So anti-capitalism takes the form of hostility to um, the, to the inheritance of liberalism, to the inheritance of modern revolution, to, uh, you know, we, we undertake, you know, people think that, you know, for instance, freedom of speech is capitalist, right? Um, and so it seems to me that, you know, there's this, I don't know what to call it, right? But there's a profoundly authoritarian face to anti-fascism today, and there's a profoundly authoritarian face to anti-capitalism today. And, and, and I, I think we really need to question these categories, right? Is it not possible that the next authoritarianism is precisely going to look like an opposition to the 20th century's authoritarianism, right? That the, the anti-fascism today is grappling with ghosts and phantoms and really ignoring um, you know, the, the, the obstacles to, um, to socialism today. How do we, what do we make of the fact that this is a language of the ruling class today? Obviously, in a deeper way, uh, in, in the history of Germany, right, where the German state has justified itself as <coughs> against itself for 70 years, right, against its own fascist inheritance. Right, it's justified its leadership of Europe precisely as an anti-German Germany. Right? Um, so, I totally agree with you that that language is inappropriate by the ruling class, and you might want to know that Tucker Carlson on Fox News, all he's saying that you know these fascists are coming to take our liberties away. But I think aside from that kind of appropriation, fascism is a serious and real threat. I don't think it's a ghost. I don't think we can call it a ghost when you know like 74 million uh, Americans. Uh, in the last elections, voted for someone who uh, was against, uh, you know, like Muslims, um, had very um, obvious anti-Semitic aspects to his campaign, and uh, many uh, and anti-immigrants, of course. Uh, when we have that, and then you're facing that, and that is basically my point. You either have a very serious leftist plan for overcoming this situation. And I'm not saying anti-capitalism is just a rhetoric. I'm saying that if we don't have a plan right now, mediated through all the potentials that we have at this moment, fascism will take over. And I think the whole situation all around the world, and even in Germany, like Germany was supposed to have been immunized against fascism and Nazism. It has a very strong Nazi, neo-Nazi uh, movement that has infiltrated into the police, into the judiciary, and these are like very serious uh, concerns that we need to um, uh, care about and think about them. So um, I don't think that uh, it's about ghosts and phantoms, but I think uh, when you're talking about anti-capitalism, you're absolutely right. But we need to I make just, it- If I could just add or refine the question, <coughs> I mean, I, I'll just put it provocatively. You know, just because Tucker Carlson says it, does that mean it's wrong? Right? No, no, no. You see that you know you still have an anti-fascist war being fought, right? You still have the language of anti-fascism, the language of national self-determination, the language of liberalism, the language of democracy being used 
to you know in the service of massive increases in the military budget and, for sure and nato you still see the, the language of hostility to white supremacy being used to execute a full-scale assault on the rights of the american people that's what i'm saying that we need to have a plan right. like i'm not saying that we need to critique capitalism so that the ruling class could use that uh, rhetoric i'm actually saying that it's capitalism that is creating this situation and uh, the whole Democratic Party, um, uh, liberals, uh, Republicans, however you call them, they are part and parcel of this uh, path to a, towards uh, fascism. So what I'm saying is that we need to recognize the realities of the ground and not be shy from calling them what they are, but we really need to think how we can overcome these problems and have, uh, you know, like start a path towards socialism. Again, but I think uh, the situation right now is not comparable to the 30s. It's way worse. And unless we think of an alternative, that is going to be our fate. And uh, fascism and environmental crisis would be serious threats against uh, human species, as a species. Can I go back for you too? Sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I'd like to uh, to uh, to second what Sarah said. That's right, Sarah. Um, uh, I I don't think fascism is a ghost either, and I, and I I know that fascism is a word that's terribly overused. It's, it's, it's invoked, you know, way too often. Uh, but we're, we're moving to a period of, uh, of increasing national strife. First of all, we're moving to a period of increasing, increasing national conflict, where the, center, the political center of gravity is now shifting from the near right to the far right. And uh, uh, George Maloney is a, uh, you know, is, is a sign of things to come. Uh, Bolsonaro's you know, performance in recent uh, between elections is a sign of things to come. Uh, what will likely be the shift of power on Capitol Hill is a further sign. Um, and, and these and, and this process of shifting to the right um, uh, essentially will 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 accentuate and intensify national conflicts, which will then lead to an ever greater, ever more intense nationalist response, ultimately culminating in fascism, which is ultimate nationalism. Um, but Biden doesn't point in that direction. Oh, I, I I fully agree with you. I fully agree. I mean, it's, it, to me, it's amazing that that you know that that that, um, that uh, Donald Trump at a recent rally called for a negotiated settlement in uh, in the Ukraine in order to prevent World War III, and the Democrats are have emerged as the party of war. There's no doubt about it. Um, and uh, and the you know the the austerity the, the austerity politics that lurk behind bourgeois environmentalism you know, is all too real. You are absolutely correct. Um, and yes, and, 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 and everything Tucker, said, Tucker Carlson says is not a lie. I mean, Tucker Carlson had a, had a, a piece that went viral, uh, a segment on the uh, destruction of the Nord Stream uh, the pipeline. That was an amazing piece of journalism. And, uh, and uh, it was quite effective, quite powerful, and quite convincing. Um, but it's equally dangerous that the far right is taking these Taking up these arguments because they they are becoming all the more seductive as a consequence, and the left is not the left, which is you know, as you point out, is folded into the Democratic Party, is towing the line of the Ukraine, and essentially is giving Tucker Carlson a monopoly of this kind of you know political criticism, which is extraordinarily dangerous. Um, so I think that the uh, I think that's that is well I guess it's really a lot of antithesis but I think that that is the problem we are facing and how essentially to to break down that trap that the that DSA and other liberal Democrat liberal liberal lefties have gotten us gotten us into. Okay, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I, I started off by mansplaining to Marxists what Marx should do. So I'm now going to sort of mansplain to Platypus what Platypus should do. Platypus should do a panel um, with, with Spencer as the first speaker around the whole thesis that he's articulated several times um, 
this weekend. I think you know, I've learned a lot from, I mean, obviously I disagree with them completely, but I've learned an enormous amount from, from listening to Spencer articulate it, and I think it would be a very useful panel to have, to, to have Spencer articulate it and have various other people from, on the left um, respond. Um, now, um, my good friend Danny here um, would accuse me of being a shill of the Democratic Party and when Danny is right, he is right. <laughs> um, and, um, and so I'd like to say a couple of words, and there are two reasons, um, uh, broad reasons why I am driven to that. Um, um, one of which I'd like to say a word about why I'm so scared of Trump. Um, and and um, uh, the first one is, um, I see January the 6th as being an attempt by right-wing um, paramilitaries to overturn the um, uh, uh, an election. Um, and um, sort of, um, you can argue about whether, whether that is fascism or not. Um, and I think one big, one big difference between, um, between Trumpism and traditional fascism is the individualism within within Trumpism, which is not part of fascism. But the, but um, that notwithstanding, um, I think there is a strong family resemblance involving the, having right wing paramilitaries as an integral part of your movement and overthrowing democratic elections um, to fascism. Um, I'm also scared. Shitless um, by Donald Trump truthing. Um, he's, he's been thrown off Twitter, so he, he now truths um, on his on his. What's it called? Social. Truth social. social. Truth, truth, truth social. Truth social. Truth social. Um, so he he recently um, 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 truths um, a picture of himself wearing a QAnon um, button. Um, and underneath it said, the storm is coming. Um, and that has a particular meaning, right? Um, there's QAnon, the QAnon's conception of the storm is that Trump is going to order patriots around the nation to um, execute and, um, if they're lucky, send people to no obey um, all the Democrats and uh, pedophiles and, and liberals and leftists and and Black Lives Matter and Marxists and everybody else. Uh, we're all the same thing. Um, and um, that genuinely scares me. And so um, I, am, I am driven to, into, um, into all kinds of broad popular alliances um, to try and ward that off. Um, Secondly, I wanted to respond to um, what Dan was saying. The other thing is that um, at the moment, there is a disconnect between Marxism and actual politics. Um, and that's why Platypus is pre-political, and Platypus has a particular response to that, that I have a different response, which is to become a shield of the Democrats. Um, and um, I think that, that um, in order to, you know, I mean, the, you can't have critique about politics, but you also can't have politics about critique. And I think that Marxism, as it is currently constituted, has not, is not dealing with the changes in capitalism that have, that have, that have occurred. And therefore, as a, as a critique, um, it is not up to the political task. Um, so, you know, uh, and, until, until you lot come up with a really good um, sort of development of Marxism to, 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 um, um, to, to um, um, confront the changes in, in capitalism, I'm going to continue, continue campaigning for Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire. Oh, uh, Danny, Danny one. Yeah, sorry. So, so, what are your thoughts on the agri communism then? But I, I guess what I wanted to say was that 
you know, going back to the, the title of the, the panel, the critique of capitalism, the greatest resource that capitalism has is our discontent. And, you know, I'm just reminded of 2017 when there was the first specter of fascism, and I think this one is just having to do with the 2022 midterms, and then probably 2024 is Trump going to run again. Um, that, you know, okay, fascism is produced by capitalism. And I raise that to say that to what degree is our bank critique of fascism a part of capitalism? In other words, it ends up serving as a resource for reproducing and maintaining the status quo. It even plays out the kind of paranoia, like finding who's a fascist, what do they really think, what do they say on Twitter, what's going on in Trump's brain, did he have that pain, does he know that he was retweeting this person, does he not know that he's retweeting this person? And that ends up, you know, corralling people democratically in, in a very similar manner. And, you know, in other words, what's really missing is that we have a lot of criticisms of how things operate today, but we have no self-reflection on the critique of capitalism. And I'm not faulting anybody at the level of thinking simply like that. I'm rather trying to get us to reflect on what's missing that could actually facilitate that, which, again, is not something really necessarily at the level of thought. There's probably something that has to do with thought there. But, um, yeah, you know, this is why I brought up Marxism's relationship to Proceeding critiques of uh, social conditions. So, I don't think you're a show for, and that's, you know, I mean, I think you're an honest Democrat, which is why I sort of applauded you for this. Um. Um, if I can add the word. But first of all, I wanted to clarify that I didn't mean that Tucker Carlson is using it, so it's bullshit. I meant that I, I just wanted to mention the level of appropriation that the fascists themselves are using this word uh, against their uh, opponents. Um, but I totally agree that it's being uh, appropriate, misappropriated. Um, but about this fascism, capitalism, um, and the situation right now, well, first of all, I think about cap um, fascism through the lens of the Frankfurt School. For the Frankfurt School, it was about psychologized politics, which is about manipulation of the audience. And on the other side, you are supposed to have rational politics that does not use psychological manipulation. At this moment, and this is what I'm working on, the whole political rhetoric in this country is utterly psychologized. And there's really no difference between Democrats and Republicans in this matter. So for example, like if you look at um, the 2020 uh, DNC, um, like there's seriously no one except for Bernie Sanders, at least on, on the first day, that talks about policies. Uh, politics and voting and elections is supposed to be about offering policies and that people can reflect on and see whether they want to back those policies or not. There's really no talk of any policy <coughs> in a mainstream media, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. And there's really the way that the um, debates, the uh, electoral debates are organized. There's really, again, no talk of pol uh, policies. So it is all about uh, psychologized politics and manipulation. But uh, just to give a concrete example of how fascism is being used at the service of uh, capital, one of the major issues that Trump brings up recently in his rallies is um, drug problem, drug crisis. And he constantly brings up you know, this imaginary conversation that he had with Xi in China, and uh, he asked Xi, um, what are what they're doing about uh, drug crisis? And she said, "Are you crazy? What kind of stu stupid question is that? We don't have such a problem." And when Trump asks why, it's because we have quick trial. Because uh, we uh, when we ha um, arrest someone with drugs, we um, uh, we have a trial right away and we execute them right away. And the uh, you know the audience just really goes crazy after these things. So the issue is that, and we know that the current drug crisis is the outcome of pharmaceutical uh, companies' policies for selling their products. So you can see very easily how, you know, like this very objective concrete crisis that we know the sources of it is being used through um, inciting violence 
or death instincts against, you know, like some petty dealers that are supposed to, you know, have caused this crisis. So um, again, like I'm saying that we need to take fascism seriously, but on the other side, we really need to think about like rational politics and um, try to have or engage in or start in rational uh, politics or rational rhetoric. Hi, I guess I wanted to ask on this question of fascism, if we're concerned with calling what things are, namely fascism, I think we ought to root it elsewhere than just at the level of the Democratic and the Republican Party and their rhetorical strategies, because, I mean, it is the mass of people in society, the workers themselves, that are making these psychological demands, that are demanding the state to come and manage the crisis of society. And so, from this lens, where do we identify the capacity to prevent fascism? Is it at the level, how, how do we create a political apparatus that is capable of mediating these demands for the state such that we can have a productive view on this phenomenon? Uh, but first of all, I just wanted to mention that you know, it's a common fallacy to think that it's workers who are backing fascism. Fascism in nature is a pe petit bourgeois um, phenomenon, and it's rooted in this, uh, you know, like position, structural position of the petit bourgeoisie within capitalism. So, and we could see that in the in January 6th, and this was uh, faced with much surprise among the journalists in the U.S. that these are not unemployed or you know like poor workers. These are lawyers. These are CEOs. The people who attacked uh, the Capitol, and we know this uh, for a fact that you know that the demography was 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 not mostly workers. It was pretty majority, but. Um, you know, the, the second part of your question, I think it's a major problematic that you're dealing with. Like, that kind of politics does not exist. But, and we need to, like, create it, create. And I think if you are thinking about rational politics, as opposed to the psychologized po uh, politics of fascism, I mean, <coughs> with any standard of reason, but we, mm, rational politics at this point would be anti-capitalist politics, would require transition to a post-capitalist society. Because again, like we are talking about the very basic, simple human need to survive. And that is being threatened. And we know that for changing the situation, we, we need means of production because and means of production should be socialized so we could think how we can, you know, like arrange things so you could feed the population over the world and also uh, try to hurt uh, environment less. So um, I think that that politics does not exist, but it needs to be created right now. Yeah, I just have a, well, I have a bigger question, I guess, for this, because I, Earlier you had mentioned that we have to be organized to sort of answer the needs of people or otherwise the fascists or the right or the far right might grasp it. But that would seem to be kind of a different question than putting fascism at the level of something like demographics. I mean, workers have supported fascism in the 30s. And, you know, really I think, when I think of petty bourgeois and proletarian, I, I, I think of it more at the political levels you know, rather than something more demographic. And so I guess I bring it up, you mentioned the Frankfurt School as well. And you know, the whole thing about fascism is like, I don't know, how you close the door is preparing you for fascism, right? That's the minimum morality and aphorism. In other words, all the conditions are always there, and it's not really kind of one stratification, but it's always a kind of political question of how people are gonna be allowed to express uh, their needs in that sense, and that in a sense, a socialist party would actually meet the same need that fascism meets. 
in a hopefully more productive uh, way. That socialism would meet that same need to, you know, transform, to politically realize, to realize one's, uh, you know, the necessity of transformation. You know, in other words, Wilhelm Reich's great study on the mass psychology of fascism that was very influential to the Frankfurt School, that basically the opportunity to achieve socialism was missed and the kind of penalty was fascism. And yet, nonetheless, there were progressive forces. There was a need to change that was kind of met by a different party, perhaps in a mystical fashion, like you know all those sorts of things of fascism. And I guess I bring that up again, going back to this general discussion, that could be met in other ways. It could be met through some hyper-democratic party stuff. It could be met through a combination of, of the uh, Republican and Democratic parties needing to destroy themselves to kind of create a new you know, center in that kind of post-neoliberal world. So just going back to this, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about that part of fascism's relationship to um, socialism or radicalism. Um, uh I think uh, fascism is a false response that will not um, solve any problem. Like it could um, probably provide, and this is like what happened in the 30s. Um, it was uh, the attempts and preparation for war that created high employment under Hitler. So they have other options, and you can see that these options, like Steve Bannon is talking about them. So the idea that you know by putting uh, tariffs on, on products, we are going to stop this, and we know that this is just a joke. We know that that is not going to happen because we have passed that point that we could go back to the national economy. Um, but um, what I said about the bourgeoisie was um, well, again, like according to Neumann and Adorno. They both think that uh, it's mostly the petty bourgeoisie who is susceptible to fascist propaganda. But of course, like it's when it becomes a um, like respectable movement that people can, uh, you know, like um, utter fascistic, racist uh, ideas. You see that it's more widespread than just the petty bourgeoisie, and other classes are also part of it. The reason that I brought that up was that. Uh, you know, like in the U.S., it is the general idea that it's the workers who uh, become, you know, like um, supporters of fascism. But um, I'm not sure if I got your question. Like, I think, um, as I, well, fascism is one way of dealing with the crisis that we are um, uh, facing now. But it is not the real solution. Uh, so all these problems and... If I could just and try to sort of put an addendum on Danny's question, I guess the question is, is socialism, can you really describe socialism as rational, right? Um, it seems to me that socialism is mass democratic politics, right? When we're looking at something like Lenin, or we're looking at something like the Spartacus book, right? you are mobilizing men's unconscious forces that are that express themselves as hatred of the ruling class right which is not the actual ob obstacle to socialism right it's resentment filled right of course socialism is fueled by irrationality right modern capitalist politics is fueled by irrationality and demagogy and the question isn't born because it seems to me when you say it's a rational politics it just sounds like to me like the Democrats talking about technocracy, right? About policies, right? Socialism doesn't seem to me to be about just policies, right? It does seem to me about a critical mediation of deep mass discontents in, in modern capitalist society. And so I think that that's what Danny's trying to say is that the, the revolution is laying the groundwork for fascism in the 1930s. That's why Reich and Horkheimer will make these statements like, you can't talk about fascism without talking about Marxism. And capitalism, as we Right, but also Reich will say, without talking about the failure of Marxism, right. Right? right? There's a reason why it's a socialist politics, right? And, you know, and the question of like, you know, are the Bolshevik slogans rational? Right, if they point beyond, you know, they're, they're, they have to be irrational because they have to point beyond what is conceivable. 
but they had to point beyond the society that we that we're in, right? It's I, I think that this question of like, you know, what Danny's raising is the question of mass politics, right? Socialism as actually trying to mobilize millions of people. And can you really say, well, this is psychology politics and this is rational politics? Is that really a way of just differentiating capitalist politics from socialist politics? Well, um, this problem was exactly the concern of Adorno when he was writing about uh, fascism. So uh, in most of his uh, pieces on fascism and analysis of fascism, he has these few lines uh, that real emancipatory politics would necessarily be mass politics because the left or Marxist revolution or whatever would not be possible without uh, the engagement of the masses. But it is exactly uh, the question of um, if you can um, do that in a rational way, and I understand your point about technocracy, but the thing is that if you think about reason in other terms, what would be more rational at this point to tell people that we need to change this system, otherwise we are going to go extinct? Like that is a rational, and um, in authoritarian personality, the book ends with this um, a sentence that if the death instincts belongs to fascism, if they are using the death instinct, then eros is, uh, belongs to democracy. So a leftist idea, socialist idea of democracy would both be erotic, and, um, but not based on manipulation. So um, Adorno has this piece that is very rarely read uh, because it's buried in this book on leadership that um, I think Alvin Goldner had edited in 1956 or so. Uh, it's called uh, Democratic Politics and Mass Manipulation. And the question is exactly that. Can you address the people and uh, try to, you know, like, make them um, agree with your policies or engage actively in a kind of politics that uh, would be emancipatory but not based on manipulation. And I think that piece by Adorno is very significant and it's something that we really need to start thinking about because uh, his argument is that if you start the manipulation process, there are always people who are better than you at it. And those are the fascists your manipulative techniques would never be able to compete with the techniques of fascists. So we need, the only solution that we have is to address the reason of people and not for technocracy or whatever, because again, like we're talking about a radical shift in how you're doing things. And I think we are at a point in history where, you know, it, it, it would be never easier than now to rationally convince people that the system as it is not right now, it's going to destroy us and the planet. So let's think about some alternative way in rational uh, manners. And by rational, I don't mean technocracy, but I understand that it could be appropriated that way. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I agree with that. Sorry, I'm done and historically, the, the, in, in Germany in the 1930s, the, the social basis for, for fascism was the middle class. Uh, the, the workers, the workers' parties, the communists, social democrats were, you know, were anti-fascist, and people assumed that union members would not, would not, uh, would be anti-fascist. Now, they didn't say the same Nazis didn't make certain inroads into the unions, didn't, didn't, you know, didn't penetrate the working class, but. The middle class was the, was their natural base number one. Uh, in January six, I forgot her name. Was this this I was I felt very sorry for this this woman who was shot by a uh, uh, a cop in the in the capital as he was trying to break through a door. I mean, she was a classic case. She she and her family ran a pool cleaning business in uh, in Southern California, I believe, and uh, the business was going bust. And she was bust, and she was blaming. The, 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 the economic troubles that they that they were facing on a whole constellation of forces, you know, uh, federal bureaucrats, uh, feminists, uh, environmentalists, etc., etc., etc. The whole QAnon uh, panoply, and and that was what drove her uh, in a classic case of distressed petty bourgeois into this 
you know, this, this fascist assault on, uh, on, uh, on, on the Capitol. Um, uh, socialism is about policies. I mean, it's not always about, but yes, but you know, any kind of political program manifests itself in policies. So socialism is about you know, very concrete things, like, you know, like, a, like energy policy, uh, carbon taxes, uh, railroads, how to get the railroads to run on time, you know, where we put railroads, et cetera, do we have bike lanes? I mean, these are, these are important questions for socialism as much as like, you know, more theoretical uh, questions. So you know, there's nothing about socialism which is how anti-practical or anti-policy. Um, and, uh, and, um, and socialism, I mean, it is radical. I mean, socialism is about the, the, you know, having, you know, arranging for you know, the, the working class asserting itself and to try to sit down collectively and through, its, through various, you know, political mechanisms to, you know, to, to sort out the problem that society has, is now faced with and to come up with rational solutions, rational in the sense that they, that they, 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 they will benefit uh, the great mass of, of, of the global population, and will point to ways of you know of, of deepening democracy, furthering socialization, you know, improving the material standard of, of, of living, uh, etc. So, you know, what is a more rational process than that? Now, yeah, it does mean like you know, having mass rallies and you know and exhorting the masses and you know putting out slogans and making incendiary speeches, but in contrast to fascism, that incendiarism. Is not an end in itself. It's its attempt to mobilize the mobilize the, the proletariat toward a rational end, and and the appeal the appeal is essentially and fundamentally rational, but it's a radical rationalism. So uh, so so the my, I think socialism be, can never be specified as policy. No, well, I'm sorry. Go on, Dan. Well, I mean, you know, Tom, um, you did mention dialectical yeah. materialism earlier. Yeah. This kind of thing. Yeah. Wait, wait. I, I bring this up because, of course, the whole goal of Marxism is to overcome itself, and the whole materialist conception of history is to overcome itself, which is why the famous preface, Marx ends by saying, so ends prehistory, meaning it's a theory of prehistory, meaning our rationality is one of prehistory. So yes, you have to set things up in a rational goal, but the point is to go beyond it. Otherwise, it falls into whether or not one intends it, it actually does point towards a kind of technocracy. Meaning, Thomas Jefferson, for example, met Robert Owen, you know, if he was familiar with Owen's socialism. From a bourgeois standpoint, socialism just looks like a logical deduction, right? It's kind of the first sentence of Engels' socialism, utopian and scientific, right? But the thing that's complicating it is rather the crisis of society, which is why it really would put class at the level, not of a social stratification, but really a political crisis, a crisis of democracy. Yeah, of Right, which is why I don't think middle class would really help in terms of trying to explain what gave rise to fascism if someone's a pool owner or if they're a truck driver, as happened with the Canada. What's the temporary of the capitalist crisis? Well, oh, somebody else says. Um, yeah, just time time to time add, to add, yeah. But yeah. The, my, my the not uh, our time is um, ending, drawing near. So yeah. I think it might be a good idea to take a few questions. Okay, and, yeah. Uh, present them to you before we have any sort of concluding remarks. Right. Uh, but everybody has to answer the questions. <laughs> oh, did someone like to answer? No, no, no. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm saying we can stay, but we don't have to answer. I had to leave for about five minutes to make a call very briefly, so maybe this is answered. But I feel like in this whole discussion of fascism, no one has been able to give a very clear definition of what it is and why it's so uniquely bad and irrational that we need to align with liberals to fight it. Like, you know, this conception of fascism as irrational politics. I mean, is Georgia Maloney really any less rational than, like, the lady who wrote White Fragility? I mean, it doesn't really seem like a material distinction between, like, it seems like people just use fascism to mean racist capitalism or homophobic capitalism at this point. I don't see it as a uh, very coherent Thing. Maybe I'm missing something, but I don't know. First one was what was fascism. I'm ready. Yeah, I was just going to ask, um, like, since the specter of like techno feudalism, whatever has been raised, since it's also been talking about um, petty bourgeoisie and proletarian, like, 
you know, these uh, classical concepts of class. Um, where, what, do, I'm curious what y'all mean when y'all talk about the working class now, like where do you see the working class invested, um, especially in somewhere like the United States, which is, um, you know, so enmeshed uh, at the top of the food chain, so to speak, in the global, you know, globalized capitalism. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering if we could maybe define, um, first of all, how we're defining class, I guess, and then second of all, um, what we mean when we're talking about the working class and then the um, and how that might relate as well to other concepts such as like the commercial proletariat, people who realize surplus value, uh, maybe working, um, trading stocks, and who might still be paid a wage, but um, you know, aren't necessarily doing productive labor, things like that. Um, yeah, Jeff, do you began your remarks by talking about the optimism of the kind of economic boom period in 1972, and how that was good, good for the left, um, as opposed to the current long economic downturn we find ourselves in now, which is bad for the left. Um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of optimism there that actually fuels the demand for socialism and the possibility of mobilizing people for that demand. On the one hand, but on the other hand, the optimistic demand to make America great again appears like uh, maybe it's actually blocking the socialist possibility of imagining a future. Um, some people on this panel. Uh, and so I'm wondering, as distinct from a socialist call for some particular set of policies that might provide an alternative to capitalism, is there a relationship that socialism has with optimism? Is there a kind of optimism that is good for socialists as opposed to the kind of optimism that is a stumbling block for socialists. Is it even possible to be optimistic right now? I'll just take one more question. Okay, no one has any questions. Okay, go ahead. I think there's one back. Okay. No, no. Um, just very quick on fascism, and I think we did, I mean, I did respond to uh, your question, I think, in a newer way. But first of all, I don't think that liberals can fight fascism, and uh, I mentioned that at this moment, like, uh, it's uh, the whole political rhetoric in this country is psychologized. But just um, to clarify the concept of rationality and reason, um, I'm using the concept as um, Adorno and Horkheimer would use it, uh, mostly Adorno. And I think um, uh, what Adorno says in sociology and psychology, he says that the telos of reason is fulfillment. And I think it, that's exactly the difference between uh, like instrumental rationality that defines capitalist order and the kind of reason that would be in harmony with socialism and uh, would be the, re the rationality of socialism. Um, I don't think I have anything more. All right, so there are three questions. What is fascism, what is the working class, and, um, and what is social dominance? The crazy meaning to it. I mean, fascism to me is uh, are the are the irrationalist, irrational tendencies in, in, uh, in, in, dec in, in a period of capitalist decadence that are raised to the to a f level of frenzy. Uh, uh, we're starting to see that with Trump, um, uh, but it's only the beginning. Uh, we see with Maloney, we see with uh, with, with Bolsonaro. Um, but it's, 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 the, it's the raising of these tendencies to their to a, the highest possible pitch, um, where they become like you know, they become a, a, a hysteria, a fever, um, and that is what Nazism uh, represented. And, and Nazism may have purported to answer certain human needs, but, but within within twelve years it had it had reduced Germany to ruin, uh, not only economic ruin and fiscal ruin, but moral ruin. Um, isn't the issue not what is fascism, but what is anti-fascism? Because is, the popular front paved the way to fascism. I, I'm, right? I, That's I, the issue. I'm right? so it's about using fascism as the thread 
to subordinate socialist politics to capitalist politics. The popular front was a Stalinist policy. The popular front went hand in hand with mounting terror in Moscow and in Spain and in a thousand other venues as well. So the popular front was a, was a, a, a counter-revolutionary policy which wound up feeding fascism. And you know, Operation Barbarossa was the, uh, was the, the ultimate com uh, combination. Um, when you ask, and, and, and today we see, you know, we see the U.S. You know, the U.S. going to war in Ukraine and Russia going to, to the war in Ukraine in the name of anti-fascism. Yet all the U.S. is doing is building up, you know, the, 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 the Bandera forces, and you know, and, and Putin is himself, you know, plunging uh, Russia deeper and deeper into a, uh, in, into authoritarianism. Um, when you ask what's the working class, and working class is simply the people who live through the sale of their labor. On a global sphere, that you know, global, global scale, that includes everyone from you know from doctors and professors who draw draw a salary, you know, you know, down to you know the the, the, the humblest uh, fast food worker or or ho hotel cleaner or whatever room pusher, uh, and there's also a vast portion of the global population that is actually sort of like at a sub proletarian level that you know makes their you know, makes their scrap, you know, gets by selling goods in Marxist markets, running errands, picking up casual labor, etc. These these are people who are in the, the most precarious position. But you take all these elements up, and they are 99.99 percent of the uh, of the global population. And as for optimism, yes, I mean, I I, I describe myself as a critical optimist. I mean, I am I am optimistic. That the working class uh, will rise to the challenge. So does that mean I can sit back and relax and and and, uh, and pop open a beer and just sort of watch while the working class goes into action and solves these problems? Of course not. I mean, the, uh, it's essentially uh, the working class will engage in struggle. It must pursue the right policies. It must reject Stalinism and liberalism. Um, and uh, I am confident it will do it. But it's nothing automatic or uh, about the process or inevitable about the process, but I think that, that humanity has overcome, it has made great strides, overcome great difficulties, and I believe that it can do so again. Okay, so number one, what is fascism? Um, um, for me, um, and this may be more Wittgenstein-like than Marx -like, Marxist, um, I would describe fascism as a family resentment. And there, are, and there are a bunch of factors that, that, that go together. One is um, a um, right-wing nationalism. Two is an authoritarian opposition to um, liberal, um, um, to, to, um, to liberal democracy, to bourgeois democracy. Three um, is um, having a um, paramilitary wing as um, as as an integral part of your of your movement, and four, which I just actually learned recently, um, which I hadn't integrated, uh, but I'm now I'm trying to, is a sort of anti-individualism, um, a sense of sort of a collective, which would be a nation rather than a class or a race or or uh, or, or a race rather than a class or whatever, and um, and you don't. For me to basically label something as fascist, you don't have to have all of those qualities, but you should have a bunch of them. Um, and I claim that there is a, um, um, and I think that, that, that what it, there is a movement in this country that, that, that has at least four of those qualities. Um, and it's become an force within the Republican Party, and that's a real concern. Um, what was the next one? The working class. I think that, that the definition of what the working class is is perhaps the key question that the uh, that a, that a renovation of Marxist critique needs to address. Um, like I was thought of sort of like the working class or the proletariat were people who didn't own any um, any uh, means of production. But produced, uh, but produced, but, but did engage in productive labor, 
and their, sur their surplus labor was appropriated by the, by the bourgeoisie. Um, sort of, so, and there were a bunch of things that went together. So sort of being productive and being immiserated and sort of economically immiserated, um, and sort of all went together. And we're now in a situation where um, the sort of most, the most productive workers aren't necessarily the most immiserated. In terms of creating surplus value, computer engineers and so forth and so on are more um, product, are more produce more surplus than 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 people sort of like working in low paid services industry jobs. And the people who are really oppressed um, and badly treated and suffering are often not engaged in productive um, labor. Um, and so I think that the um, the um, whole you know conception of class needs to change, um, or needs to be needs to be fought through. Um, I think the next the next issue is that um, the uh, um, that we have to if if, if Anger's theory about the knowledge about the knowledge economy is correct, or if techno feudalism is correct, then the classes that are going to be divided are going to be somehow different from what, what, what they were under industrial capitalism. And, um, and, Mark, and Marx's analysis would have to work what that, what that was and what, what that new constellation was. Um, and let's see, what's the next one? Yes, optimistic. Optimistic, yeah. <laughs> um, optimistic. Um, so like, I could be um, like typical of my, anybody who went to, was a leftist in colleges during the 80s, would answer this question by quoting Gramsci, you need optimism, no, um, optimism, pessimism of the intellect, and optimism of the will. Um, and I also think of, of Blaise Pascal, who basically said, you know, um, sort of, like, like, you might as well believe in God, because if you believe in God and you're wrong, it doesn't matter. But if you don't believe in God and you're wrong, you're gonna be done in eternal dam damnation. So, if we're pessimistic, to a certain extent, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, sorry, if, if things are, go, are inevitably going to go badly, um, and we're pessimistic um, or optimistic, it's not going to matter very much. The only hope is if we're um, to take advantage of our optimism. I just want to say one last thing if I have a chance. Um, I grew up, um, I was attracted first to Marxism as a teenager way back in the 1970s. And a big part of the appeal then was I was growing up in Britain, and there was the emergence of a thing called the National Front, which was a neo-Nazi um, organization. And a big thing that attracted me to, um, to, um, to the leftists and the Marxists, oh, you know, even though I was in the Labour Party, I'm socialist, I didn't join the Latin, but, um, 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 was the fact was the was the sense that the Marxists uh, at that point, especially the Socialist Workers Party in Britain, which is different from the Socialist Workers Party here, um, um, were the ones who were serious about um, about um, um, fighting fascism, and that the liberals weren't. I have to say that in this current period, one of the things that's driving me in the arms of the liberals is that um, I have a sense that, that Marxists aren't particularly serious about um, opposing um, fascism um, and, 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 are down, and, and are downgrading danger. And the liberals who don't necessarily, I mean, I think there are all kinds of problems of sort of like, you know, um, practice like in terms of, of unions, um, you don't need all workers to be fascists. If a, if enough, if a, if a small, if a large enough minority um, um, turns to fascism, we are up the creek. Um, and I don't think that the that, that the labor institutions that I am um, part of um, really know how, well how to basically counteract that. Um, but I think that at least. And I think there are all kinds of problems with technocratic liberals and everything else. But at least they're taking um, 
um, fascism seriously, which is more than I can say from much of the left. So I'll just say two things. Uh, one, in terms of fascism, I think fascism is the wound of the failure of socialism. I mean, there was an opportunity for socialism that was made good on by the right. And so I think the kind of fixation on it today kind of reminds us of the failure of socialism. I would not really actually give certain qualities to fascism, like is it nationalism or are there paramilitary groups? I mean, one, in a sense, all these things, you could say, well, should have said paramilitary groups. You could say that they were about the rejuvenation of Russia. I mean, certainly they had to appeal to all of these things. So going back to the question of socialism and fascism, I think it's really the inner wound of the missed opportunity for revolution and really how it gets sort of instrumentalized today is deciding which ambulances around which parties are progressive and which are reactionary. I mean, the Tea Party is called fascist, Trump's were called fascist. Whenever it's around the Republican Party, it's fascist, and when it's around the Democrats, it's potentially progressive movements. Second thing I would say about the working class is the problem with saying that the working class are those who have to live by selling their labor is the kind of famous thing regarding proletarianization is a lot of people cannot sell their labor. That's the whole kind of crisis. And so one can distinguish the working class and proletariat. I mean, proletarianization is really the crisis of bourgeois society, right? The, the word citizens without property, meaning they cannot realize themselves in civil society, but they can realize themselves politically in democracy, which is why I was saying that democracy was being driven by the Industrial Revolution. So really what makes the proletarian class then is not that people sell you know, labor for exchange, which in a sense is what commodity production was based on, but really the political crisis manifests in the class struggle, which I would not put at the level of stratification in civil society, like petty bourgeois or small business owners and proletariat or working class. I used to work at a Bed Bath & Beyond. Was I a productive laborer? Was I an unproductive laborer? That's not really the point at that level. The question is about the class struggle, which is at the political democratic level. So I think that's, and yeah, optimism, you want to be optimistic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the last thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, please. Um, um, all right, and I guess we can just begin the concluding remarks. Uh, <laughs> I think it's bad that we've been here a long time. Yeah. Thank you. Great. I'm sorry that we have to catch you up. It looks like you wrote a lot of attention on us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.